Good morning. Good morning. It's April 9th, 2023. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Um, my name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Sunday school class where we're going through the Bible. We started in Genesis. We're now in Exodus chapter 24, beginning Exodus chapter 24, where God is delivering the terms of the covenant to the people. It's not just, here's Ten Commandments, I just want you to live by, see you later. But he's making a covenant. You do this, I'll do this. I'll do this, you do this. You do this. It's an agreement, it's a contract. So he's delivering the terms of the contract um, to the people. And they're all agreeing, yes, we're going to abide by it. Of course, they didn't, but they, they thought they were going to. So um, in Exodus chapter 24, verse 1, it says, Now he said to Moses, so they're at Mount Sinai. They've just come out of Egypt. They've seen all kinds of miracles, so they're not dealing with somebody they don't know. They've heard stories for 400 years, but now they've seen with their own eyes the plagues he brought in Egypt. They've seen with their own eyes how he parted the Red Sea, get to the wilderness, they're out of water, and he turns the bitter water sweet. They're out of food, he rains down quail and manna from heaven. So they're, okay, we know who you are. Um, so they're entering into this agreement. So, Exodus chapter 24, how can I describe it? He's kind of backing up. Um, that, okay, he says, Exodus chapter 24, verse 1, Now he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. So don't get too close, but come up farther, because God's on top of the mountain, the people are down below, Moses is down there with him. Come up like halfway. Meet me halfway. So here's what has happened. Um, God met them at the mountain. and uh, Because it's kind of like a parenthesis. The last four chapters has been kind of a parenthesis. God met them at the mountain. right after he, it, it took 50 days to get there because they were fooling around. Once they left Egypt. Uh... But they finally get to the mountain, and God appears. In, in um, oh, here's what I want to talk about first. Who's he calling up there? He says to Moses, "Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu." So Nadab and Abihu are Aaron's oldest sons. Those of you who recognize those names, Nadab and Abihu, know that they get killed soon. Because their offer a profane offering to the Lord. We'll discuss what that is. Like, what gets you killed? Um, so when we get there. But he says, you, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. So why is God saying, come on up? Because, again, nothing surprises God. We just serve the God where we don't have to inform him of things in prayer as though he did not already know. The prayer is for us to get our connection to God so we can understand and listen and what's he saying and we can bear our burdens, and but we're not. We're never informing God. God's not going. Wait, slow down. What happened? Uh, God knows that Aaron, that Nadab and Abihu, his older sons, he knows they're going to do something really profane in the presence of God, and that's kind of the standard. Like, how close are you to the fire when you do the dumb thing? I would always tell my students when I was teaching, when I'm telling you stop it, when I'm telling you be quiet, when I'm telling you to say okay, when I turn around and go back, then you can give me the finger, then you can make a face, but in my face, when I'm right there, if you defy me right there, then I have to kill you. What you do at home, what you do, when I, when that, it's less disrespectful <laughs> if I don't see you it's not right in my face. It's still disrespectful, but it's less. There still be consequences, but to find me right in my face is a problem. And God is that way. So it's what, what you did right in his face, the consequences were quicker and stronger. It's like when the paper gets closer to the fire, the heat exists, but once you get close, all right? So Nadab and Abihu, he's calling them up into the presence of God so that they won't sin. He's calling them up so they can see this is a real God. 
he knows what they're about to do, but God always gives us a chance, even if he knows we're about to mess up, so that we cannot blame him for anything. We, well, I didn't know, I didn't. Yes, you did. And that's why you got this sort of punishment, because I brought you up right into the presence of God. You heard my voice, you were there, and you still thought I couldn't see you or something. And Okay, so he calls up Aaron. Aaron is Moses' older brother by two years, two years older. Nadab and Abihu, four years older? Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's oldest sons, didn't call Moses' sons. Because even though Moses was the, that was not their calling. Moses' sons, they had other talents, apparently. <clears throat> and then it says 70 of the elders of Israel. So these 70 elders, Moses has been dealing with them for a fall, that, that from a, for a long time. They represent various tribes uh, of the 12 tribes, right? These are the older people. Um, he dealt with them after he'd been, because there's two sets. There's the officers of Egypt and there's the elder, I mean the officers of Israel and the elders of Israel. So there's the active generals who are commanding people and telling them what to do. And, and then they're the wise council, right, who people listen to because of their wisdom. And it's kind of two separate people. And there may have been some mingling. So when Moses was talking to the burning bush before he ever went back to Egypt, they hadn't seen Moses in 40 years. He left 40 years ago. And then God sets a bush on fire and says, hey, now it's time for you to go back. And that happens. Things that we've given up on, things that we've let go of. God says, okay, I'm glad you let go of that. Now I'm taking you back there because now you're different and you can handle it. So in Exodus chapter 3, 16, he says, go and gather the elders of Israel together. This is God talking from the burning bush. And say to them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. Now, that's funny to me. Because God, because God is giving them a visual. God's always giving them a visual. So it's like uh, I peeked by your room and I saw you hadn't cleaned up your clothes. I visited you. I, I've stopped by and I've seen, and now I'm ready to answer your prayer. He just wanted, like, this is the time that I'm going to do it. But it's not like for 400 years I was on vacation and I finally showed up. He just wants to give them a visual that now is the time that I've come in and I've seen, and now I'm going to take care of it. But tell that to the elders, because everybody listens to them as far as spiritual matters are concerned. Uh, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 29, uh, Moses has, oh, so uh, Moses and Aaron, but Moses didn't want to talk to the elders, because he just thought nobody would listen to me. So he says, can Aaron speak for me? Okay. Well, actually, Moses says, I'm not going to do it. And God said, Aaron will do it. I'm, I'm, I'm already aware of your nervousness about speaking to people. So I've already got somebody to go alongside of you who will take care of that form. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people, and they were convinced. Okay, so first he does it with the elders, and the elders go tell everybody else. So God, Moses did not gather 500,000 people in an auditorium and said, let me show you. He gathered the 70 elders and they went out. Okay. Next is chapter 5. After Moses did his first, when he first went to Pharaoh to say, let my people go, Pharaoh didn't react very nicely to that. And he increased the workload. And he said, now you're going to have to make bricks without the straws. You first you have to have to gather the, normally we'd supply the straw that goes with the mud that makes the forms the shape. You're gonna have to spend all day getting the straws and then making the brick, and you had to make twice as many. Now, so uh, in Exodus chapter five, verse twenty, it says, "Then and these are the officers, not the elders, the officers. Then as they came out from Pharaoh." They met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. So these are the Israeli officers who had gone to talk to Pharaoh and said, Oh my God, what are you doing? You increased our workload. And he said, Well, blame Moses. 
So in verse 21 of Exodus 5, it says, And they said to them, Let the Lord look on you and judge. This is Aaron and they were talking to Moses and Aaron. Because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. You have, look how horrible you've made everything. Now, Pharaoh didn't come and kill them. They were exaggerating. But they're not looking at the spiritual. They're not looking at the ultimate. This ultimate is going to work out for their good. These are the people who only see the immediate. We need to know this because Pharaoh, Moses is going to be dealing with these people in the, in the wilderness they're the people who see the immediate. I gave God uh, 39 days to answer this, and now it's day 40, so we're out of here. We're going to see that in Exodus chapter 32 when the people decide to go back to Egypt uh, because they don't see the long-term plan of what God is doing. The elders saw the longer-term plan. The officers did not. So they're the ones yelling at Moses, how dare you, right? Uh, and sometimes things look like that. You've made everything worse. And God's like, no, it's not worse. Just be patient. It looks, feels worse. It's not. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 21, it says that Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, pick out and take lambs for yourself according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. He goes to the elders, not the officers. And, and explains a spiritual thing to them. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 5, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. This is when they are at the Red Sea. And take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. And behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. And you shall, oh, I'm sorry, this is not when, this is not the Red Sea. But you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. Right after they got from the Red Sea and there was no water. I'm going to do the spiritual thing in front of the elders, so take them with you. People are all upset, but they will see that I've already got water in the rock. And sometimes we go to these desert places and we don't think God already had a plan, but he does. We just have to calm down. It looks so bad. It looks so terrible. God has a plan. But the man said and the people said and my boss said and it, all right. Yes, but God has a plan, He's, so he can, he can bring water out of the rock, okay? So whenever there's a spiritual event like that, take the elders. Whenever there's a physical event, the officers of Egypt would be there. And again, those are the people who only see what's right in front of their face. It takes someone wiser to live longer to say, I've seen this before, it's all going to work out. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I always, God always works it out. Um, so, Exodus chapter 24, verse 1. Now, he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and worship from afar. So, this is what has happened in Exodus 20, the past four chapters. Remember, God, it says, God spoke all these words. And this is literal. Um, they're at the mountain, and God had said, In three days, I'm going to come down. And they said, Yay, we're for it. In three days, God came down, and they literally heard God's voice speaking out of the cloud and the thundering and the lightning. It was too much for them. But it says, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage, and you shall have no other gods before me. And he gave the Ten Commandments. So everybody heard God give the Ten Commandments. At the end of the first ten, the people said, too much. You're doing too much, God. So, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, it says, Now all the people witnessed the thundering, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Don't fear, for God has come to test you, that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. Like, this is good. You need to be afraid of God. Because so you don't act crazy, you need to know there really is a God. My wife and I often are watching certain things that happen and think, those people don't think there's a God. Look what they're just doing. They think there's no God. They're just doing evil in front of everybody. And they don't think there is somebody up there keeping score who's watching, who's going to, you know, that they can just get away with stuff. And for a while, they get away with stuff. And that's because God is merciful and he gives people a chance to repent. But... He's not crazy. 
He's not boo-boo the fool. And eventually, you just keep acting up. So there are people who think there's no God. So Moses is saying, God's doing this so that you are aware, you feel his presence, you know he's real, so that you won't act up, so that his fear may be before, before you. So this is him, even though you can't see him, this is, he can see you. So then Moses went up, and for four chapters, this is what God, uh, what we read in the last four chapters, the law where God said, uh, treat your neighbor right, uh, do this and do that. God spoke that to Moses and the elders. The elders heard, but Moses was was uh, writing, was listening to all of this, and then he's going to come down and tell everybody. So the four pages that we just heard of law, again, there were two types of law where God said, here's the consequences. This, these things that you do in front of the community, here's the community response to it. You'll stone this person, or you'll do this or do that. The community has a response to these things. But then he said, these things that you do in private that no one sees you, like you saw your neighbor's donkey fall into the pit, and you just walk by and say, mm, too bad. I see that, and I'm going to punish you. So, so the things that you, no one else sees, I see. So he divides it that way. So those are the things that God specifically just told Moses privately because the people asked him to. And then Moses comes down and tells them in chapter 24. So uh, in Exodus chapter 24, verse 2, it says, And Moses alone shall come up near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So don't let the people come up, because they'll definitely get burnt up, because they are not fully persuaded. They're acting up every five minutes. And so there'll be the consequence uh, based upon their actions, right? The closer you get to God, the more the fire will burn. So... Stay back. Um, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 21, 22, it says, So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew, drew near the thick dark darkness where God was. So this is right after the Ten Commandments. The people said, So Moses went on up. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus ye shall say to the children of Israel, Tell them all this stuff. You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. And all the, the past four chapters, all those laws, he gave them to the men. So now we're back in Exodus chapter 24, verse 3. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord. So that was a, just a parenthesis. That's everything that God said to Moses. But then Moses came down and told the people. That's what I was trying to say. They saw the thunder and lightnings. God didn't disappear. But they didn't hear his specific voice. But they knew that God was talking to Moses. Because they had just heard God in the cloud for Ten Commandments. Then the cloud moved farther up. Moses moved farther up. So they saw everything. They know God's still talking. But they didn't want to hear the voice. Not so much. So God dictated all this to Moses. The elders came halfway up so they can witness this spiritual thing. Because God always wanted the elders to be aware of what was going on spiritually. Then he came back down and he told them everything that we just read in the last four chapters. So it says, so Moses came down. Exodus 24, 3, and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. Here's, and here are the consequences, right? And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. This is the third time they've said that. They said it when God just simply said, in three days I'm coming down. Yes, we're with you. Then after the Ten Commandments, they said, everything God says we will do, just don't tell it to us personally. Tell it to Moses. Okay. So Moses came down and told them, and they said, yes, time number three, everything God will say we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. So he wrote it all down and made like a, a covenant agreement. So what we're going to witness in chapter 24 is kind of the ceremony, rectifying, validating the covenant, whatever that word is, you know, ratifying. Thank you. I'm so glad that my wife has a brain that she shares because sometimes mine leaves me. So he ratifying the covenant. So, Exodus chapter 24, verse 4, second part of verse 4 says, So he rose early in the morning, and then he built an altar at the foot of the mountain. So this is part of the ceremony. This is just the ratification ceremony, right? He built an altar. This had been started with Abraham, as far as their people are concerned. However, um, um, they, uh, as far as blood sacrifices and that sort of thing, God had established that with Adam and Eve. He didn't have them kill an animal and clothe themselves in animal skin just because it was fashionable. They had sinned, 
And when Moses wrote that down, everybody, because Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, but it gets numbers Deuteronomy, right? Everybody who read at the time, Moses was not there when Adam and Eve sinned. God personally explained the whole story to him, so he wrote down everything God said. Um, the people knew what had happened. Oh, well, they sinned. We know that, the, you know, they had to build an altar. There had to be a blood sacrifice. They killed an animal. So Moses didn't write that detail because he expected everybody to read the whole Bible and know that God didn't change blood sacrifice for sin, especially the very first sin. Let me establish this is, the, this is how that's handled. If you sin, there must be a blood sacrifice. All the way down to Jesus, blood on the cross. Let me establish that now. That didn't happen as God was writing the Bible. God would, you know what would be good? If I had a blood sacrifice, I hadn't think about that earlier, but I'm started right here in, in Exodus. He had started it in Genesis because he knew what was coming. So, um, so the altar, uh, he establishes with Abraham. Abraham does his altar thing because God had already established it. In, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to, to, and said, To your descendants I will give this land. This is right after Abraham has first gone to the promised land. He, he's in Syria, and God says, Get up and go to a place I'll tell you. Just start walking. That's the God I know. Doesn't tell you everything so you don't mess it up. Just do the first thing I'm telling you to do. Abraham starts walking, and when he gets there, and God says, I'm giving you this land, he builds an altar out, out of respect to God, saying, you are in control of everything. It's our sign of respect to God. You, are, you own the universe, and I'm not worthy to be in your presence, but because of the blood, you make me worthy. So uh, it says, and there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So this building an altar thing was not, they didn't go to Moses. What are you doing? They understand when you're showing God a sign of respect because he is uh, doing his word. He's backing up his word. You are, you're showing respect to that. Okay. In Exodus chapter 24, the last part of verse 4, it says, And he took 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. So he built an altar, and then he has 12 pillars. Where is that coming from? Why do you have 12 pillars? Well, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. When Jacob left home, because Jacob felt that he had to try to trick his father into giving him what was uh, belonged, initially belonged to Esau, the birthright. And we don't have to trick, God's going to give us what is ours. We don't have to trick people out of it or into it. And God's not going to give you some, oh, well, you know, you tricked uh, uh, Isaac, so I guess I have to give you Esau's. That's not, God had already decided when, when Jacob was in the womb, he'd already said, there's two nations inside of you, but the, the, the elder is going to serve the younger. God had already decided this. So Jacob didn't have to trick God into it or trick his. So now Esau's going to kill him. Jacob is on the run. Uh, he runs all day. He goes like 30 miles, and he's exhausted because he's scared to death because that's who Jacob was. He's very scary. And he goes to sleep. He has a dream where God shows him that there's this connection between him. And that's what Jacob's ladder is about. Not, ooh, wouldn't it be fun to go up and down an escalator? Mm -hmm. But look, see how the angels are constantly coming up and down from heaven to earth? That's the connection. He has to give them a visual aid. They have no Bible. So there are things that God is doing visually to sear this into their mind to explain his relationship with him. Uh, we don't have to have that because we've got the word, the Bible. But... At that time, Jacob had no idea where God was or who he was, so he had a dream. See, my angels are constantly coming back and forth, so you don't have to worry. You are connected. So Genesis chapter 28, verse 18, it says, Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head that he was sleeping on, and he set it up as a pillar, and he poured oil on top of it. Now, he's going to make a deal. If you can bring me back to this plate, like this pillar represents me. I'm pouring oil, I'm anointing it. This is me. This is my marker. I want to come back here to this place. I don't know what's going to happen when I get all the way up to Syria, where um, my grandfather's relatives are. I don't know if I'm going to get killed along the way. I don't know if Esau's going to, I don't know what's going to happen. And 20 years later, he was back there. But if you bring me back to this place, I'll worship you and I'll make a whole pillar, you know, a whole house of worship here. So he says he poured oil on top of it and he called the name of the place Bethel, which is the house of God. Oh, 
But the name of that city has been Luz previously. He called it Bethel, which means house of God. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I've set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So this stone represents me, but he brings me all about back here. Then I'm, this whole place will be God's house. Uh, so it's like I'm making a deal. Uh, in Joshua chapter 3, once they got to the promised land, um, and they have to cross the Jordan, God says to Joshua, and it shall come to pass, in Joshua 3.13, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. So they're, they're carrying the ark. That, and he says they need to go across. They're going to stand in the middle of the Jordan. He says that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. So because you guys can't cross the Jordan, have the priest go across and just stand in the middle of it. The waters will part, just like the Red Sea. And that's what happened. And all the people walked across. So there's 12 priests holding the ark. 12 priests, one representing each tribe. In Joshua chapter 4, verse 3, it says, And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, and actually this is verse 1, that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them saying, Take for yourselves 12 stones from here, from the Jordan, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's foot stood firm. So the 12 stones represent those 12 priests. Take 12 stones, because the stones are pillars representing the people. And you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. So these two, and they set up 12 pillars when they got there, and they represented the people. So the altar represents God. The pillar stones represent the people. So he set up an altar. He set up 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes. Here's what he does. And they're, again, they're setting up, they're ratifying this covenant. Because God has said, here's what I'm going to do. Then they're going, okay, we agree to it. And sometimes you need to read the fine print. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. So these young men of, of, of Israel, they're offering the burnt offerings. Originally, each family was to have their, their oldest son was going to be a priest for that household. Um, God changed later because he saw they could not handle it. Well, he already knew they could not handle it. But he's offering, he, God always offers us the A first. Like, hey, if you get all these questions right, you'll get an A. Now, we don't study and we only get a C, our fault. But we could have gotten the A. It's up to the, t the teacher can't say, you know what, I'm not even going to give you half this stuff. I'll just give you all C's to start with. The teacher always says, here's the possibility. Here's what you can do. If you just study, here's what you can do. Now the teacher's looking out. I can already see this person's asleep, and that one's not paying attention. He just threw a spit wad. But I still have to offer you so that you know what you could have done. So that next time you think, oh, man, I only got a 60. I could have gotten 100. Let me be encouraged to go forward, as opposed to the teacher just already deciding in advance. You're only going to get a 60, so I'm only going to tell you 60. People used to do that. You would look at the, uh, you'd have students in your class. And you'd say, oh, these girls are never going to be engineers. They're never going to be maths. So I'm not even going to tell them about that part, right? And instead of, let me just offer them the whole thing, because maybe some of these ladies will become engineers. Maybe some of them will become, right? They used to just decide in advance. Or you might see black students or Hispanic and say, oh, well, you're never going to be a lawyer. You're never going to be a doctor. Whatever, th you know, you might look at your female students. You'll never be a doctor, right? People used to make those choices. And so only offer certain things to certain people. Wrong, right? Offer the whole thing and then let that person decide if they want to achieve. Because uh, most of the time, we were wrong when we were looking at. God's never wrong. God, God already knows who's going to achieve and who's not going to achieve. But he still offers the best, right? Here's the top. And so that we can, can only look at ourselves when we don't do it. We can't say, well, God never even told me about that other part. So in Exodus chapter 19, God had said in verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you'll, you'll be a special tre treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine. Everybody belongs to me, but I'm going to make you special above them so I can show the rest of the world what it would be like to have a relationship with me. 
in verse 6 of Exodus 19, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. So all of you are going to be priests. All of you are, are, are going to, you know, in every family, you you're all have this access. So he offered that first to everybody. They screwed it up, which God knew what was going to happen. So he already has Aaron and his family in motion, right? But you'll be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And these are the words which you shall speak to the Israel. But for those priests, you have to make it. You can't be a sometime priest. You're vowing to be the connection between God and man. And so you're saying, this is who I'm going to be. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to listen to God's voice. And I'm going to represent him to the people, period. I'm not going to uh, lie about what God said or kind of change it. I'm going to be right up front. Here's what God said. Here's what you got to do. So God's looking for those channels who can totally represent him to the people. Uh, he eventually, that didn't work out. So in Exodus chapter 32, coming up soon, because we're only in 24, Moses goes up a second time, right? So they're, they're ratifying the first part of those four chapters that I, we just went over the past month uh, or two. And then Moses is going to go up a second time. And while he's away, that's when the generals, the officers, other people take over. The people who can only see the immediate, they're not able to see the long term. Well, he's been gone. He, something must have happened to him, and they go crazy, right? We're gonna, we'll get there, but we all know the story. We all saw the movie and everything. They, they build a golden calf. They go out of their minds. Moses comes back down, and he says to them in Exodus chapter 32, verse 26, Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And they really have to decide. I don't understand this. You and I don't understand the decision. But I guess because we know the consequences. But at the time, they thought, these people have made so much sense. We're going to go back to Egypt because we've been out here in this wilderness. And we don't know about it. food. We don't know if, if tomorrow God's going to go on vacation and there's not going to be any manna. The water may dry up. We don't, but we knew in Egypt we had, I mean, it was Egypt, but still, there was routine, and Moses has been gone, and this God is unpredictable. We look at it and think, you had the choice of who's going to be on the Lord's side or being on Barney's side, and you picked Barney? What? So we don't get it, because we know what happened next. So he says, whoever on the Lord's side come to me. He was expecting all the priests, the different priests from all the different families, the ones who had just signed the covenant, did this whole thing in chapter 24, to talk to their family members and saying, hey, I'm representing God, and you need to do what God says. And blah, blah, blah. So let's all go to Moses. Nope. It says, uh, all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. Only those people. So he says, I want you to be a kingdom of priests, all of you. Only the Levites came. And he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from the entrance to the to entrance throughout the camp, going to every household where those priests in every house should have been doing their job. And let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, every man his neighbor. Very dark circumstances, but that's the penalty if God is right in front of you. He's thundering and lightning. You heard his voice. He's the God of the universe. He's part of the Red Sea. And you give God the finger. You say, ah, I don't want to hear that. Well, let me show you. I can show you better than I can tell you yeah, what I'm going to do. Here's the punishment. Because you just signed the covenant saying, yes, everything God said I'm going to do. I told you what the punishments were. And you, I don't get it. So let me show you. You apparently don't think I can back up my word. So he has to do that. Again, it's the teacher who says, class, be quiet. You're going to get in trouble. And when they don't get quiet, you just raise your voice louder. Class, I said, class. And they said, oh, we don't have to listen to you because you don't ever, you don't follow through. So why would I listen to you? So that's why it's so important. Follow through immediately. So people go, oh, okay, this person follows through. I get it. Uh, anyway, so, uh, and in Numbers chapter 3, verse 5, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron the priest, that they may serve him. So initially he says, I want all of you to be a kingdom of priests, but that's the 100% I'm offering to everybody. I can see that you can't do that, that you put your needs before what I am saying. So the Levites, there was something in them where they were clear. 
So you're going to follow me. I'm going to make you serve me. But at the time of the signing of the covenant that God had been making with Moses for four chapters, he says, let all the young men come forward, the priests from every family, and here's what we're going to do. So in Exodus chapter 24, verse 6, it says that Moses took half the blood. Oh, and so what they did, I'm sorry, they did a burnt offering and a peace offering. A burnt offering, you took the animal and the whole thing was consumed in fire. The whole thing consumed, period. That was representative of, it's all yours, God. The burnt offering is all yours. The peace offering was like a fellowship offering. So they would, I hope this doesn't bother anybody, they'd slit the throat of the animal and, and they would take the blood into the basin and then they would cook the animal and eat it as a sign of like having a meal before God. Um, and, and the blood was poured out on the altar, etc. So the burnt offering is, it's all to you, God, but a peace offering was a time of fellowship. It was a, it was a symbolic of, of, of us sharing. Um, there were different types of ways to ratify covenants. So uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5, it says, Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons, by covenant of salt? So there was a, there was a salt covenant where, because uh, salt was this precious thing that uh, preserved food, you know, they didn't have refrigerators. They certainly couldn't carry refrigerators around with them in the desert. So they would take the certain food and they'd pack it in salt, right? And it would preserve it, keep it from dying. So uh, they looked at salt a certain way. So we're going to have a meal together. I'm going to give you some salt and we're going to have some salt and we're going to make a salt covenant. Uh, it's like you take some gold, I'll take some gold because they value salt that way. And we're having this kind of covenant. And it's Genesis chapter 31, verse 54, when Jacob's uncle came after him, Uncle Laban, because he had taken his daughters, Rachel and Leah, and the, and the grandkids, and had bumped out, that's, that's for Shelby, and had left. Um, Laban chased them down, and they made a covenant together. The Lord watched between me and you. This is our covenant. I'm not going to come on your side. You're not going to come on my side. The Lord watch. If I come over to your side, then you get to kill me. If I come over to your side, you get to kill me. I'll kill you. They made a covenant. So it says, then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread. And they ate bread and they stayed all night in the mountain and they ate together. That was a, that was a ratifying of the covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 18, it says, and I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant. So here's the punishment, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and pass between the parts of it. So that's another way they would make a covenant is, is cut a calf in half and then they'd walk between the midst of it. So it was one piece and we're, this thing that was whole, we're, take, we're cutting it in half, we're walking in the midst of it as a sign that we are now joined one like this calf used to be. God did that with Abraham uh, when he talked about your, your people are going to be in bondage for 400 years and, blah, 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 and then I'm going to bring them out and I'll bring them out to this place. In, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 9, it says, so he said to him, why do I feel like it's chapter 17? Uh, oh, no, chapter 15. So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and he cut them in two because Abraham's going to be, what's going to be the sign that you bring my family back here in 400 years from today? And so he brought the, all these to him and he cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but did not cut the birds in two. And verse 17 says, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning to torch that passed between the two pieces. So God made the covenant with Jesus. It, it, it's like God, like you can't, you won't be able to fulfill your side of this, but I need it to happen. These other covenants I'm making, I know you guys are going to break them. But this covenant, all that I promised through Abraham, including the, all the nations of the earth will be blessed and through your descendants and that whole thing, I'm going to make it with myself. So there is a burning oven and a smoking fire, a burning torch and a smoking oven. They pass through the pieces 
and he made the covenant with himself. So that was God like making the covenant with Jesus. This, he's going to fulfill his side of the covenant. So that's why it's unbroken. It's like, yay, thank you, Jesus, for coming down and doing that and dying on the cross, which we're celebrating today, because we wouldn't be able to keep it. And we'd have to be punished. But now Jesus kept it for us. He represented us in that, everything that he did. And so now the covenant's unbroken. So God can do all that he promised to do. We didn't have to, but since God knew it was going to happen, he knew Jesus was going to do it, he started fulfilling the covenant. He didn't wait till Jesus did it. I can already see he's going to do it. I can already see that you guys are going to break it. Uh, but I can see that Jesus is going to do it. So that's why I'm able to do everything that I'm able to do for you. So in Exodus chapter 24, back to Exodus chapter 24, and we're almost done. Verse 7 and 8 is the last verses. It says, then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. So he read all the, the past four chapters. Here's all the things that we said we're going to do. This is everything that God said. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. They love to say that. Everything, I'm with you. I will do that. These are the things that people promise to get the job, right? Now, these are, you got to be up here at 6 o'clock every morning. And, you gotta, and people will be very clear. I need to do this. I need that. And people say, yes. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because we just want the job. And then we show up at 8 instead of 6. And we wonder why we got fired. Well, I don't understand. So he says, we're going to do it all. And Moses took the blood. So he sprinkled it on the altar, right? Now he's sprinkling it on the people. Now there's a chance that he sprinkled it on the pillars, because that's why he set up the 12 pillars. And they represented the people. So the pillars represent the people. Jacob said, here's my pillar. If you bring me back here to this spot, then I'll worship you. And, and when the, that's why I read about they took the pillars representing the priest, and they set them. And the, so I think he might have sprinkled it on the pillars. That's why he set the pillars there, because I don't know that there was enough blood to sprinkle it on 500,000 people. But the pillars represented them. So he had an altar representing God, the pillars representing the people, and that they took the blood of the peace offering, sprinkle it some on the altar, sprinkle some on the people. And he said, oh, and here's why. So the, uh, so the people are part of the sacrifice. In Romans 12, chapter 1, it says, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, so that you be a sacrifice. So God didn't have to cut the people and burn them up or, or kill the people. He killed the animals, sprinkled it on the altar, then sprinkled the blood on the people or the pillars, right? And so you're also part of the sacrifice. So you make yourself a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. So that's what it's representing. We're also presenting ourselves, but we don't have to cut ourselves and climb on the altar. But you're a living sacrifice. The blood is sprinkled on us, right? Christ's blood is sprinkled on us. So in, in Exodus chapter 24, verse 8, the last part of it says, And this is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So this is the ratification. You heard all my stipulations. You heard the Ten Commandments. You heard the part where I said how to treat your neighbor and how the community was to stone people who didn't fulfill this. You saw about, heard about all the things in private that only I see you do, and yet I will punish you. But I also told you the whole parts. So I'm going to bring you to the new land, and with milk and honey, I will, I will, I will drive out your enemies before you. I will feed you. I'll provide for you. Here's I, I'll protect you. I will take away all the sicknesses from you. I'll do all these things. That's my part. All I'm asking you to do is not kill your neighbor and you know not worship idols. I'm not asking a lot. Just like love people, basically, and love the Lord your God. That's all I'm asking of you. So they said yes, and they ratified the covenant. Spring of blood on the altars, spring of blood on the people, but I think it was the pillars. And um, then we're done, supposedly. So we know that soon Moses is going to go back up and God's going to explain more about the altar and the, the duties of the, of the priesthood, etc. Because they've said, yes, we will do it. And we know that while Moses is there for 40 days, getting these instructions, very specific instructions on how, how we're to worship God, the federal, that the people, it was too long. I know we just signed this covenant with God. I can still see the clouds. I can still see the sun and lightning. But it's been 40 days. And, you know, God crazy. He might, you know, go to Europe. So let's go back to Egypt. And it's just weird. 
But our, your, our minds do that to us. Our minds are those Egyptian generals or those Israeli generals who say, you know, God's going to forget. God didn't remember that I needed a job. God didn't remember that I need to pay my rent. God did, you know, so I'm going to go do something crazy. Let me go get drunk. Let me go jump out, you know, let me go yell at that per. Uh, that's the, the, that's the uh, Israeli officer in our own brain that just makes up a story about God. Well, God's not going to come. You know, you know what you ought to do? <laughs> you ought to do this. Cut the leper. Cut the leper. Exactly. You know, right. And so we listen to that voice. So we can we can look at these people and go, well, what was wrong with them? But what's wrong with us? What else does God have to do? God's done so much. Uh, <laughs> but when there's a delay in what we want, when there's our things are happening differently than how we thought they should happen, we go crazy. We tell ourselves a story, and we just and then we become them. So that's why these stories are written, so that we can look at them and go, ooh, Jesus, help me not to do that. So I am done with t for today. Um, at 11, at my church, there will be a musical on the, on the Easter. I, every year I write a musical, a little 45-minute musical, um, on some aspect of the resurrection of, of the last you know, days of Christ's life and all that. So if you want to watch that, cool. Uh, hopefully you'll be enjoying yourselves at your own um, Easter services, etc. And so God bless you, and uh, I'll see the rest of you on Wednesday. We're in the book of John. All right, bye-bye.